Um, I've been asked to demonstrate spindle work. That's mainly what I do in the shop. I do a little bit of everything as far as woodworking goes, but I mainly turn spindle stuff. What I wonder is what kind of problems do people have with their spindle tools? Catch is brought up. Skating. Cutting beads and coves. <laughs> Cutting beads and coves is not difficult. If we can teach six or 16 year old kids how to do it, trust me, y'all won't be any problem. Um, if during the course of this anybody has any questions, please do me a favor, ask. Part of the reason I say that is when I first started turning, I turned for three years on my own before I ever found anybody else that did wood turning i thought people did turning in their basements at night and oh god please not not during the day oh no, no. but um i got lucky um a friend of mine got flyer for classes being taught in parkman ohio by a game guy by the name of rudy osolnik i couldn't even pronounce his names had no clue who he was but he's teaching his class he definitely knows more than i do i want to go take it and fortunately it was one of the smartest the luckiest moves i ever did Come to find out he was head instructor at Berea College for the woodworking program. He started and ran it for over 40 years. He was one of the president, founders and president of the Southern Highland Handcraft Guild. He had pieces on permanent display in the Smithsonian Institute. And one of his bowls was given by Eleanor Roosevelt to the Queen of England as a wedding present. Wow. That I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to demonstrate, like Steve said, is taking it from a square to a round. Then I'll show a couple of beads and coves and something you're going to hear me say. What is it, Ray? Bring in. <laughs> That's one of the biggest things I find teaching beginners is that they, they're okay rotating the tool, but they don't want to swing the handle. And that's one of the biggest things you've got to do to create a round surface. Um, up here on the table, I've got an assortment of gouges that I use, spindle gouges I use, everything from monstrosities to little teeny ones. <laughs> well, the vast majority of the turning I do, these are two go-tos, either three-quarter roughing gouge or half inch spindle gouge, either one of these. When I first start out, I mainly use a three quarter. Now you get, I'm gonna, having a, having a lathe with adjustable speeds is, it's really nice. All right, so if I don't, with spindles, you've usually got a square section and then a turn section. If I don't have to worry about a square section, I start off on the right hand end of my piece. That's just me. Um, doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but that's, that's just what I do. Um, come in fairly square to the piece. Rotate the tool. Come on, slow down. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Answer. Now, norm 
Sir? Ryan, on your tools. Pass back. <laughs> Pretty much, you know, um, people talk about degrees and angles and this kind of thing. I just, I grind what works. Um, it's kind of fun. What is the guy's name? But there's a turner that demonstrates with a skew that does phenomenal work. Mike Dunbar. Mike Dunbar. Um, or Mike Darlow, I should say. Now, normally, what will happen with beads, they'll have different widths beads. What I'll do is come in. I want to come in. Stop for a second. What I want to do. The depth shoulder I want to put on the side of that bead is what looks like half of the overall dimension. Or the distance from the center line to the edge. Now, normally with a pattern, I've got dimensions that they give me that I've got to hit. So I'll use a pair of calipers on this, but just doing beads. Uh, which one? You go here. All right. I, since the outside corner is a, the, the thickest part, that's where I'm going to start taking material off first. So I'll start near the corner, and I roll my handle. I move a little closer to the center line and I roll my handle again. Now, this one is the one where the magic happens. I roll a handle and then halfway around this roll, I start to swing the handle. Same thing on the other side. Outside corner is where I start my cut. I roll the handle, I roll the handle, then I roll the handle, and I swing it. Part of the way to think about it is I'm pushing the cutting edge around the corner. Larger beads, same thing. Start near the corner. I take a little bit off. I take a little more off. And I take a little more off and I start to swing the handle. Same thing on the other side. Start near the corner, take some off. Start near the corner, take some off. Start near the corner. Take some off. All right. Got to go back and touch it up. Start near the corner and I roll it. Start near the corner and I roll it. Start near the corner. I roll and swing. Start near the corner. 
I roll it. Start near the corner. I roll it. Start near the corner. I roll and I swing. Three sixteenths on the parting tool. But All right. Well, let's see if we can address what you're talking about. All right, come on up. <laughs> now, what I want you to do is mark out, mark out your bead and your space between it. Just give me outside corner. Okay. Outside corner, how much space between them? Oh, okay. All right. About that much space between them. Ah, okay. That's, yeah, that's, yep. Uh, come on. No, what'd you just do with it? Sitting up here. All right. Just for giggle's sake, center lines. Outside's easy. Kind of like that. The key to it is don't try to do one all at once. Do it halfway, get it out of the way, go to the other side, get that one out of the way, then you can work back. Then you can actually get down to the depth of the depth you want. As opposed to having oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes, sir. My father would have slapped my head, slapped the back of my head saying, yeah. I don't do it as often as I used to, but it still happens. It still happens.
<laughs> well, somebody, somebody once said, oh, you make that look easy. One of the first jobs I had was staircase spindles, 165 of them, six beads per, per spindle. By the end of it, trust me, you're rolling beads in your sleep. You don't even think about it. They're all going to be close to the same, too, right? Well, that's, that's what, what you hope. hope. <laughs> that's what you hope. Deep. From a distance, it's all look the same, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, people ask me, what's the difference between an amateur and a pro? An amateur, they look the same. A pro, they look the same. That's basically what it boils down to. And you end up with a lot of sawdust on the floor to get to that point. Always turn the lathe off before you go adjusting your tool rest. Not that I've ever screwed up and been in a hurry and not done that, but what did you do with a pencil? Baby? What did you do with that pencil? What did you do with that pencil? And stick it in your pocket. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Which pocket? Put a piece of yeah, that's masking tape over the <laughs> top of it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what's funny. As tiny as that pocket is, you'd be amazed how fast it gets filled. <laughs> yeah. Let me grab a pencil from back here. Should have brought a half dozen with me. Oh, you got one? Thank you. Thank you. Now, you were talking about codes. Yep. Codes are kind of the opposite of beads. Where with a bead, we started with our handle square and then swung it out. How do you think a cove is gonna go? Handle starts out and you swing it in. Now, the center line is where most of your material has gotta come off. This is, this will be kind of like a parting cut, but all I'm doing is going in and creating clearance. I'll go in and cut some, cut some, get near my outside line. Then my handle starts out, and I, I literally lever the handle up. I lever the handle up, and I roll it through to the middle. Same thing on the other side. I lever my handle up, and roll it through to the middle. What I'm trying to do with the lever up is bring bevel and cutting edge in contact at the same time. If I don't do that, it's gonna catch and skip every single time. Go in and create a little bit of clearance. 
a little bit of clearance, a little more, and a little more. And the thing you have to remember is scale. Since it's a lot smaller, I don't need to create anywhere near the depth of cut, but I still have to swing the handle and bring my cutting edge around. Here my outside corner, swing my handle. Start near the outside corner, and I swing my handle. not that difficult um what i try and encourage people that are just starting out to do is put a piece of wood on the lathe and just play god knows how many how many how many times i've you know i've got to create something no you don't <laughs> you got to put something on the wood on the tool on the the lathe and just play work on beads work on codes whatever you have a problem with it was funny, one class I taught, three of them could go right on a bead, three of them could go left. I ended up going to the bathroom. I come back and, wait a minute, what did, they'd all switch places so that they could finish each other's beads. <laughs> it's like, okay, y'all are smart. That, that, that's cute, I like that. Now, I'm gonna stand right here. Go ahead, do a bead from start to finish. Yeah. Um, any other questions on any of this? It's, it's really not all that difficult. Um, the vast majority of spindle work is just beads and codes, just different beads and codes. And where you run into um, issues sometimes are the, the longer spindles that are fairly thin. Those can be a little bit of a chore to work on, but that's the beauty of a steady rest or what I've done in the past is if I, if I don't really feel like taking the time, I've got a leather glove. I'll wrap the leather glove around it and use my hand to support it. I try not to do that too much because I can develop carpal tunnel that way. And I really don't want to do that because I've dealt with it once and I don't want to deal with it again. Um, in dealing with that, anybody in here ever dealt with carpal tunnel syndrome? Um, I got fortunate and one of the guys I played basketball with was one of seven of a particular type of physical therapist in the U.S. And he did woodworking as a hobby. And I explained to him what was happening and what was going on. And he said, well, how do you hold your tool? And I kind of looked at him. Funny. He said, no, how do you hold your tool when you're, when you're doing turning work? I said, well, normally I hold it like, like this. He said, well, do yourself a favor. Go from here to here. Sounds odd, but if you think about it, if you go to squeeze someone's hand like this, you can apply a whole lot of pressure on that without even thinking about it. If you extend that finger out, trust me, you've got to consciously think about putting pressure on it. The other thing he said was, how small are your handles? I'm like, hmm. They're normal size. He said, if you can wrap your thumb around your fingers, your handle's too small. And it's proven to be true that, you know, I've, I don't consciously do it now. I, I don't even think about it, but during the course of the day, I'll go from holding here to just moving this around. As long as it's not staying in one spot, I haven't had any problems with it since. So... <laughs> Yes, sir. Most definitely. The time I found the time I found catches is when I'm trying to do it and just. Would you? 
Yeah. Um, what I try to do is keep the bevel in contact. That's the reason levering up the handle here. I try to bring bevel and cutting edge in at the same time. If I just bring in cutting edge, it's going to catch and run every single time. But if I bring in bevel and cutting edge, even if it's just a tiny bit of bevel, it gives me just that little bit secure in the cutting edge and I can go ahead and roll through the cuts. Uh, care to come up and try one? <laughs> With this, it's, it's about center line here. I, me personally, I hadn't, I hadn't adjusted this one at all. I just left it where it was. I like it a little below center so that when my tool is on the rest, it's actually in the center line of the work or slightly above it. It looks like most of the stuff you're doing. You're I was, I was a, little a little above the center line, yeah. Okay, so that's not, I mean, just a, you look like when you were, when you were just rounding the stuff up, it looked like you were quite a bit above the center line. That's because the tool rest, I never adjusted the tool rest. I thought the tool rest was bottomed out and I didn't, I didn't look at it. But you care to come try Cove, sir? <laughs> when I was, uh, when AAW was in town, I ran the, uh, the lathe room they had down there. They had a bunch of lathes set up for people to come in and, run them and try them and we dealt with everything from 60 year old kids to 85 year old men so okay, so all you right make a bead i'm gonna start the parting tool, parting tool one of them. This one? that'll work just fine yeah. now the depth you want to you want to get go down is what looks to you half the distance half the distance the overall width or distance from the center line to that yeah, edge. Right. Now there's no real right or wrong on this. It just and all you're doing is coming straight in and plunge cutting. When you're not running the tool it gets kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> Come on in a little more. more. Come on in a little more. There you go. All right. All right. Now, this is the one I'd suggest. All right. All right. Now, me personally, I use the overhand grip. My problem using this, I found out that I end up pushing with my thumb and I get movement in the tool tip when I don't want it. That's just me. Okay. Whatever works for you. Uh, now, to, to me, I'm almost like I'm too close for this. For, for this. Is that where no, you you're normally fine. need that? Grip? You're fine. Okay. All right, you're starting near the corner and all you're doing is doing a roll. Okay. That's one. I like this. Now move over a little bit and do the second one. Good. Now this third one, you're going to do that roll again, but halfway around the roll, your handle is going to start to swing out. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. There okay. you go. That gives me a clearance. That's the part that I think I wasn't doing. I didn't get enough clearance for this if you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Same thing on the other side. You start near the corner, roll a little bit off, roll a little bit off. Now you're going to roll and start halfway around. You're going to start to swing. Handle's coming to you. Handle's coming to you. Oop. Handle's coming to you. There you go. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. What you have to what you have to think about 
is if the bevel is guiding your cut and you want that last little bit down here at 90 degrees, that's where your handle has got to end up. Ah, okay. Swing the handle, swing the handle, swing the handle. The handle's got to go. The handle's got to go. <laughs> uh, I got to get in my own way. I'm All getting right. In my own way, and I and I cut in too deep, so I didn't get so I've, I've lost okay. the shape. All right. Now, what I'll suggest, we'll go. Eh, we'll make a little bit of a parting cut. Right here. Yeah. All right. There's your center line. We're going to roll that direction. So you're going to start with it square. Start with it square. Bring your bevel in till it's just touching. Pull your handle up till it starts to cut and roll. Move over a little bit. Do that again. Good. Now we're going to swing on this one. You know, roll, swing. Come on, come on, swing. Good, good, good. All right. You got a pretty good representation of that. All right. Now, what you're going to do is come about a sixteenth of an inch this side of the line and do the roll and swing again. Just starting to cut. Good. Now, roll and swing. Good. Good. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Good. Now, you've got a pretty good roll. You've got okay. a good, pretty good curve there. You ought to be able to step a sixteenth of an inch further than that and do the exact same thing, roll and swing, and just create that curve again. Now, what you want to pay attention to is the thickness of the cut. If you start getting a lot thicker, that means your handle is swinging too quickly. Wow. If you start getting thinner, that means your handle is not coming around fast enough. Okay. Makes sense to you? Well, let's let somebody else try it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, yeah. Thanks. Anybody else want to try it? It's not that difficult. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? Practice, <laughs> sir. Pummels, pummels. Yeah. Dave, if you're going to buy a spindle gouge, you recommend half inch to begin with. Um, either half or three quarter. The thing I found out is I can always do small work or big work with a small tool. I can't do small work with a big tool. So um, what I do is figure out what you think the vast majority of spindle work is going to be. You know, if it's going to be larger stuff, go with a third quarter. If you're going to be in the middle of the road, I'd go a half inch. Have we done any tops, spin tops? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We did a bunch of them at the fair. <laughs> It seemed to be one thing that kept the kids interested. Would you would you ever use a quarter inch or anything? Oh sure. Oh yeah. You mean kind of like this one? I use it. I use it doing small detail work. I rarely rarely use it on big stuff. They call it a quarter inch for a reason. If you get it a quarter inch off a lay off the rest, it's going to bend. Is that what you use for a video? It would depend on the shape and the thinness, thickness and thinness of the spindle, of the finial. Um, most of the time, with finials, 
I use the same half inch gouge I've been using, or if I've got small details in there, I'll use this one. And then with the little snowman earrings I do, I use this one. God, it's so nice to have a laser with adjustable speed on it. Um, believe it or not, it's a quarter inch, quarter horsepower motor that came out of an old gas pump with a four-step pulley on it. So you kind of you kind of put it on and hope. I usually start on one end or the other. I rarely, I rarely start in the middle, just because I don't, I don't want to blow it up on me. If I'm if I'm starting with a square end and the rest of it's turned, what I'll do is go down and turn the square end, square end first, establish that feature. Part of the reason is um, <clears throat> if you happen to screw up, I've got the other end I can switch. <laughs> now, what do you want me to turn, Danny? Uh, a pummel, light green pummel. Just a pummel. Thank you. Is it best for you transition from square to round? Oh, okay. Not a problem, sir. We can do that. And most of the time they're in bead shape. But what's really interesting about that, let's do something here. Let's see. We've got one here. That's where the top of it's going to be, and your slope will probably end up about here. And what's really interesting is it'll look like it's curved. Very rarely, rarely do I get a pattern that's got one that's curved. But the interesting thing is, if you do, Then it just looks that much more attractive. The other thing is, is <clears throat> it'll shed water a lot easier. That's mainly the reason that they put put these features on. They want to be able to shed water. Very rarely will I ever see one that's scooped like that, because then it's a place to hold water. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, interior stuff might be a little different, but. Do they typically transition into a land or a bead or a hose? Just about anything. Um, most of the time, they end up coming to a flat that will transition into a cove or a bead.
seen a lot of stair balusters and whatever they're taking it in for heat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't have the faintest that's just, that's just me installing wouldn't have the faintest idea what you're talking about yeah. 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 The sting. <laughs> anybody have any questions? Anything anybody like to see turn it? Like I said, you take a hundred and so many spend. Yeah. Yeah. Add to that 30 years of experience. Yeah. Yeah. I still screw up. I still screw up. But the interesting thing is how you fix your screw ups. That's the difference between an amateur and a pro. <laughs> Anybody want to try to turn something? I'm standing here. I'll give you a hand. Wait, wait, I got about, about 10 minutes. Come on. Somebody's got to want to try it. No guts, no glory. No guts, no glory. I'll show you all how it's not done. <laughs> Part of the education process. We won't charge you for that. That's awesome. <laughs> what do you want to try for? I don't know. I was asked to come up here. So. <laughs> try a bead or a cove? Uh, let's try a bead. All right. Go ahead and turn them on. All right. The outside two lines. 
Here's your center line. First thing we want to do is do a parting cut. Oh, let, me, let me switch that out. There you go. And this side goes up. Now you're going to go down what looks to you to be the distance in the center line to that edge. No right or wrong, we're not going to put micrometers on it, but, but you may want to go just a little deeper. Well, if you just a touch deeper. Good. I actually had somebody show up in my shop with micrometers to measure my work. How'd you do? I was off by five thousandths, so they didn't, they didn't want to pay me. And just a little bit deeper. Just a little bit deeper. Looks good. All right. Now we're going to go here. In. Start near the near the corner because that's where the vast majority of the material's got to come off. I'm going to suggest this hand turn over. Okay. There you go. I'm going to start right here. You're going to bring your handle down, bring your bevel in. Okay. Now you slowly pull your handle up till it just starts cutting. Right about there, and now you roll it. Good. I'm going to do that again, a little closer to that center line. Good. Now, this time, you're going to do that roll. Now, halfway around that roll, the handle's going to swing toward me. Keep rolling, keep rolling, keep rolling. There you go. Okay. Same thing on the other side. Bevel comes in contact first and you roll it. Good. Bevel comes in and you roll it. Good. Now, bevel's going to come in and you're going to roll it. Now, swing the handle to you, to you, to you, to you, to you, to you. To you. The handle, handle's got to go that way. It's got to roll that corner. There you go. There you go. Huh. No one died. <laughs> All right, question. How many people had 911 on speed dial? 911. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Probably it's getting close to Not a problem. Not a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent job. Like I said, anybody anybody got any questions? Anybody got any questions? None? I recommend Alan Batty's video on YouTube. <coughs> okay. He's talked about the future of what he does most of the work for the future of the work. For spindle turning, Alan Batty's video, I think. I can look at that, you know, you're using the spear. You know, so I, yeah. Now I have to go look at it again. Because I, you can forget that yeah. stuff so easy. Well, it's funny. Everybody, everybody here talks about a skew. Has anybody, does anybody in here know Doug Campbell? Used to be a member of the Richmond Wood Turners. Yeah, can you, can you come with the skew? I can't. Doug Kent. I, I was <laughs> the third, third beginning lathe class I was ever teaching. I was teaching how to use a spindle gouge, how to turn. I said, the reason I don't teach a, teach a skew is because I'd have to set one tool down to pick up another. You can't go from this and can't go from a bead to a coat with a skew. You can't do it. And Doug had walked in the door behind me. I never heard, I never knew he did. He goes, who said you can't? <laughs> uh, while I'm standing here with egg on my face, uh, could you possibly show us, Doug? And he stood right there and did it. Now, the thing with that, 
Doug has spent a lot of time figuring it out and how to do it, and he make it, he makes it look very, very easy. The first time I stuck one in there and just went skating all over the place, scared me half to death. But it can be done. Just because just because other people can't do it doesn't mean it can't be done. So um, anybody ever has any questions on any of the spindle work? If you got any woodworking questions in general, you can give me a call. My number's in the um, members, members directory page. So if you, you know, give me a call. It's not a big deal. What do you use for sharpening? Do you use like a slow speed? <coughs> um, it's the, pretty much the same blue one they've got back there. For me, sharpening wise, I tend to go with the slower speed, slower speed grinder just because it allows me that much more time or that just that much longer before I burn the edge of the tool. What grit stone do you like to use? Personally, on mine at home, I've got a um, 80 and a 120. 80 to just rough shape and then 120 to put an edge on. I have I haven't tried the new metal wheels. I haven't really tried one, and I'm just mm, I'm kind of there. That's just just me. A, a lot of us have the the CBM CBM wheels, uh, <coughs> but, but but then you get you get people like Dan that doesn't have a CBM wheel and says the same wheel he's had for what ten years. Twenty. 20. <laughs> I was gonna say I don't think I've ever changed. Yeah, I've never changed mine. <laughs> 